All right, good, good morning. More and more people, 18 people already, and it's not even quite 10.30. Uh, you know, oh, it is now. It's just become 10.30. Very good. So, good morning. Um, it's, <laughs> you know, with the whole daylight saving time, what do we call this? Spring forward time, summer time? What do we call it here in the UK? Back in America, growing up, we'd call it... Um, uh, I can't even remember, Daylight Savings Hour or something. Um, With this this corona lockdown, with this corona lockdown, it's almost like it doesn't matter. Um, (laughs) For some of us who are confined to home and can't get out, you know, you kind of wake up, you change out of your nighttime pajamas into your daytime loungewear, and then you think about what you're going to do all day. And you try to do... do something more productive than just uh, eat snacks and stare out the window and wish you were going places. Uh, but this morning we act, and so it doesn't really matter what hour it is. In fact, it might not even want, matter what day of the week it is. Anyone else this week get confused? Is it Wednesday, Thursday, Friday? I don't know. This whole lockdown thing, being trapped in our home, is, uh, just makes it all blend together. But this morning you had to pay attention. You needed um, to pay attention just in order to be here on time. You see, some people are gonna forget and they're thinking that it is seven. Hey, Richard, hey, there's someone from Great Chesterford. Richard, I tell you what, if, you're, if you can hear me right now, can you take the link to this broadcast and um, put it in the Great Chesterford WhatsApp group and maybe even on the Great Chesterford uh, Facebook page? I would do it. But the laptop that I have next to me is, is just absolutely frozen. The Wi-Fi here is just, it's just that bad. If you're able to do that, that would be a big help. Okay, how's, are we almost ready? Yeah, I think we are. In just a minute, we're going to begin worshiping. I think all of our, uh, hey, Suzanne, good morning to you. So, in just a minute, we are going to begin there we go. We're on Great Chesterford too. Good. Um, uh, thank you. Yeah, especially into the. Um, thank you, Richard. Especially into the WhatsApp group. So, I don't know. Sh- should I start off with another Corona joke, like I did last week? Everyone seemed to, to like that one. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Here's here's my Corona joke before we begin. Um, all right. Uh, the joke is, the joke is, oh, I've heard so many this week. Maybe some of you need to type something up. Okay, quarantine. You get it? Quarantine. No, some of you haven't get it? Okay, well, it's an inside joke. Okay. All right, I think, I think we've got everything now. Present, correct, great. So welcome to church, everyone. If you're just uh, logging in, we've been giving some announcements and just making sure we're uh, set up correctly. Uh, My name is Joshua Jones. I am the pastor of Great Chesterford and Fairfield Chapel. And I hope our congregations are are with us this morning. If you're not part of either church, well, we welcome you and hope that you can be part of... uh, our worship time this morning. A uh, couple of just quick announcements before we begin. One, uh, tonight here on the Fairfield Chapel uh, Facebook page, there will be uh, just a, an evening worship session at 7 o'clock that Ben, uh, ben Marsden, one of our elders, will be doing. Uh, also, some of you, when you come to church, are used to giving as the collection plate goes around. Uh, there'll be some information, too, in the comment section about how you can give, either online or by text message. Um, and and I, I, I think there was probably one more, but I'll be getting back to you. Hey, good morning, Sharon. Welcome. Great to have you guys. Good morning, Ruth. Wonderful to have. Welcome to church, everyone. So good uh, to see you all. So we're about to begin. I'm just going to pray. We're going to go into a time of worship with music. Uh, the, um, the lyrics are below in the comments section. So if you shrink the window down so that my face becomes a little smaller, which, uh, you know, hopefully I'm not that hard on the eyes. 
Uh, the lyrics will be all down there, and you won't be looking at me anyway. You'll be looking at the chapel and my wife. Uh, but the lyrics will be down there so that you can sing along. I know it may be weird uh, singing in your home, but you know what? We're supposed to praise the Lord everywhere, wherever we go. We're going to be honoring him. And so if you're there with your family, maybe you're sitting on the sofa, uh, just try singing together. A bit of an unusual experience, but we're going to do uh, all we can to make this work. So, Father, I thank you for everyone who is tuned in online. I thank you for those people from Great Chesterford, from Therfield Chapel, for everyone uh, who rose this morning aware of the hour difference and want to take out this time to honor you and to praise you and to sit under the teaching of your word. So be with us now, we ask. Uh, inspire our praise within our houses and open our ears to hear from you. Amen.
cast into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who was in every sense tempted, like we are, yet without sin. Let us then come with confidence to the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. It was Hebrews chapter 4 from verse 14.
Father, we thank you for our leaders. We thank you for Boris Johnson. We thank you for Angela Merkel. We thank you for uh, Macron, the president of France. We thank you for Donald Trump. We thank you uh, for Xi over there in um, uh, Xi over there in uh, China. Father, for the different world leaders dealing with uh, having to make decisions that affect the lives of of millions, of, if not billions. Father, we pray that you would download to them supernatural wisdom, that they would make decisions that are best for their people, for the nations. Father, we pray for our villages and towns. We pray for Royston. We pray for Therfield. We pray for Great Chesterford. We pray for these different uh, villages and towns that they would come together and that some of the, uh, the very best, Lord, the, just the very best of uh, human care and sympathy and compassion might be expressed. Lord, that you would have your way in our towns. We ask you to strengthen all the churches, not just our churches, but all the churches who are trying to work in the name of Jesus to bless their neighbors, uh, to love those who are isolated. Lord, would you bless their efforts and bless their works. Lord, we pray for a solution to this whole coronavirus. We know that this sort of lockdown and isolation cannot go on indefinitely, that it cannot uh, go on long term. We just pray for the best way forward in being able to proceed from this place of very strict um, rules and regulations back to a, a healthy, prosperous society. Give our leaders wisdom to know when and how to do that. And for our congregations. Lord, help us to love one another. Help us not to waste this time, but to grow in the knowledge of you, in love for you, and love for each other. Strengthen our faith, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes. And please, if you have any prayers to comment, to post, just put those in the comment section, and we will amen all of those prayers. Well, welcome to church. Everyone's still with me? If you've come on a, a bit later after I started, the Wi-Fi signal up here in Therfield seems very weak. It seems like perhaps all our villagers are just waking up and having brunch and streaming their uh, Netflix movies in HD. So I'm hoping this has come across. Can anyone throw me a comment, let them know that... Uh, just to let me know that we are, this is still working. Anybody? Oh, come on. I need somebody just to throw out a comment, say hello, we're with you. All right, I'm going to go on faith. 
that somebody's still out there. I'm not seeing any comments. I'm not seeing any comments. Oh, I see a little like. Okay, I see a, th a, a thumb go up there. Can someone put a comment? Anybody? Uh-oh. You see, now, I'm, I'm beginning to worry. You need to do something for me here, folks. You need to let me know that we are still a go. All right. I, I'm not seeing any comments. Nothing else. You know, you may be home posting comments right now, but... Uh, but maybe it's just not popping up on my screen. Oh, I see a lot of likes. All of a sudden, a whole barrage of thumbs has just uh, appeared. Okay, well, I'm going to go and think, and even though I don't see your comments or anything like that, I'm going to go trusting that somebody out there is actually getting this. Yeah, oh, look at those. I see lots of loves there. Okay, that's great. Wow, somebody, Richard, you're a very loving guy this morning. That's great. Um, super. <laughs> Proudfoot, super. Keep going. All right. Yeah, Ben, thank you. I got my little WhatsApp message there. Um, <clears throat> so we're just going to begin. We're going to begin. And for whatever reason, um, here's the challenge because a uh, little technical challenge. I want you guys to be able to message in your questions at this time. Um, and it seems like, for whatever reason, the comment section on, on my end is not working just because of um, uh, Wi-Fi issues. If you are on WhatsApp and you're part of the, maybe the Great Chesterford group or you're maybe part of that Thursday group that Fairfield Chapel has, or um, try WhatsApping them in because I, I have WhatsApp open here as well. And so as I'm going, as we're teaching the Bible, uh, it will be a message, but I don't mind being interrupted by any comments, either through Facebook or WhatsApp. So I'm happy for this to be a little Q&A. Uh, once again, welcome to everyone from Therfield Chapel, from Great Chesterford, and, and for all those from other churches who are joining in. We're going through the book of First Thessalonians. So if you have your Bible open to First Thessalonians chapter 5, some of you are sat on the sofa right now and you realize that you do not have, uh, you, you don't have your Bibles. Go get your Bibles real quick. Take it up, down, off the shelf. Hopefully you won't have to, you know, dust it off because you've been using it during the week. Turn vibrations off. You know, I should have done that before I began. So if you hear any vibrations uh, while this is going on, that is my phone vibrating because it means somebody is sending me a WhatsApp question. And I'm not clever enough to have turned off the vibration. I've turned off the sound but not the vibrations. Um, uh, I'm afraid that that sort of technical expertise is above my pay grade. <clears throat> but so we will, we, what we will be doing is starting in verse 16 of chapter 5. Got your Bibles? Everyone's dusted it off? Okay. We've been looking at the book of 1 Thessalonians. Paul is writing to a group of Christians in the city of Thessaloniki, a city of about 200,000 people, very big uh, by the standards of the day. They knew persecution. They knew hardship. The people who had become believers usually paid big social and cultural prices from either the Jewish or the Greco-Roman community of which they had been a part. So to become a Christian sometimes cost them their job, cost them economic opportunities, cost them relationships. Uh, they had paid a very steep price to follow Jesus to, um, in, in their baptism. Uh, you know, I know many of you, when you were baptized, when you made a decision to follow Christ, not everyone in your family liked it. Uh, not all your coworkers liked it. Uh, there are people who changed their opinion of you. Um, and it, it came at a certain social cost uh, to follow Christ. And yet these Thessalonians, they knew all about that and even more. Whatever it's cost us, it's probably cost them 10 times more. And he's finishing up his letter. So this is the, the very last message from the book of Thessalonians. We've been going through this letter. Paul had written them this letter, and we've been going through it for several weeks now. And this week we're coming to the very end. And he gets to the end. And he, he lists off a bunch of, a, a bunch of sort of commands. And there, there's one thing that we can um, deduct, I guess, from these commands. How many of you, if I were to say, I am an INFP, how many of you guys would know what I'm talking about? Anybody? 
Yeah, if I were to say I'm an INFP, maybe about half of you know what I'm talking about. When if someone says I'm an INFP or I am an uh, ENTJ, uh, some of you, maybe about half of you, no, we're talking about personality types, particularly the whole Myers-Briggs uh, personality test. Uh, and there's a lot of different spin-offs of personality tests, just not Myers-Briggs. There's, uh, I see a lot of people on Facebook posting about the whole Enneagram, which um, I'm not sure what I think about that. Supposedly, uh, that's a very unusual uh, type of personality test, but some people say they like it. Um, and even my daughter, who's 12 years old on social media, you know, a lot of times she'll tell me about some of these personality tests. You know, you might see them floating around different, you know, what type of rock are you? Are you a ruby or an emerald? Or uh, what type of color unicorn are you? Are you a yellow unicorn or blue? And you take these little tests and it comes back and it tells you, it tells you uh, what sort of personality. And I'm, uh, sorry to interrupt, I'm looking out the window, it's actually snowing here in Therfield. Is it snowing in Royston, in Great Chesterford, wherever you're at? We're actually getting snow right here. Strange. It has nothing to do with what I'm talking about. I just noticed it. But you get these strange personality tests. And people, our culture, are really obsessed with them. People really get into these things. Whether it's something very sophisticated, like the whole Myers-Briggs test, or uh, a lot of the cheap popular spin-offs. You know, um, what flavor, if you were a coffee, what flavor coffee would you be? <clears throat> And what, why are, now, deep down, most of us knows these, these things are silly. You know, we, I guess very similar to this, you got to do the whole, um, you know, what's your sign? What's your astro, what, what star formation are you, you know? And we're obsessed with these sorts of things because deep down, we really want to know ourselves. I mean, that's sort of been the liberal Western idea for, I don't know, for centuries, for millennia, know thyself. There's been an obsession to really know, who am I? But the Bible, it doesn't start there. In fact, it really discourages uh, that as being our starting point. That this whole idea of self-knowledge, that I need to know myself. Well, the Bible actually says, first and foremost, our, our main problem is that we don't know who God is. And because we don't know who God is, we really don't have a good grasp on anything else. And if we want to know our universe, we want to know about ourselves, we want to know about the people around us, one of the first things we need to do is get to know who God is. And when we get to know who God is, everything else, including ourselves, begins to fall into place. This is important because sometimes we can take this, um, uh, this surrounding culture and its values and bring it into the Christian faith. So, for example, in a culture where we're all caught up in uh, personality tests and, you know, I'm a yellow unicorn or I'm a blue rock or I am an INFJ, the, the underlying message here is that uh, nothing is wrong with me. I'm just different. Okay, this is who I am and you need to accept me for who I am. And there's you, nothing's wrong with you, you're just different, and we all need to just affirm you and applaud you and say, you are such a beautiful rock, you are such a great, uh, you know, pink bunny, you are such a great E, N, F, Q, B, C, D, E, F, G. Um, and it, it brings in this mindset that the right thing to do when approaching human beings is, is just to um, affirm, point blank, we affirm you just the way you are. And we can bring that sometimes into our Christian faith, thinking that's what the gospel's about, that that's what Jesus is about. That we come to God and he affirms us just the way we are. But that's not entirely true. That's not entirely the message of the New Testament. Now, God may love us regardless of our faults. Regardless of our sin, God loves us and he comes to us even when we're a mess. And he cares for us, but it's, it's not to affirm us just as we are. It's to love us and to transform us. So the message is not, I'm okay just the way I am. It's God loves me as I am, but I'm not okay just as I am. We need to be changed. To use a, kind of a popular, uh, perhaps overused phrase, but we, you know, we need to be born again. That's actually a very good phrase. It's in the Bible. Sometimes it's, it's used a bit mindlessly, but it, it really means that God grabs us as we are 
And he begins to bring a new life into us. And we see this with these commands that Paul, Paul ends with. Let me just read a few of them, and then we'll go back and kind of go through them. It says, Paul says in verse 16, Rejoice always, pray constantly, give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Don't stifle the Spirit, don't despise prophecies, but test all things. Hold on to what is good, stay away from every kind of evil. So Paul isn't saying, hey, just keep doing exactly what you're doing, because that's fine. He's saying, here, I'm ending this letter. Love you guys. Oh, by the way, boop, 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 this, 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 this. So the idea is that we are to change. We are to be actively doing things that maybe we're not naturally doing. The first one is this. It says rejoice always. Very first command, rejoice always. Now, for Paul, that's not a new command. He writes that in many of his letters. Rejoice always is a very frequent, um, it's a very frequent command in the scriptures. But for us, when we hear that in a, you know, our 21st century Western culture, it, it kind of hits us a bit funny, doesn't it? Does it hit you? Find me hits me funny when I first read it. You know, it's, it still hits me funny when, when I read it. It's just uh, because we don't, <clears throat> our understanding of happiness is just a little bit different. Uh, and we have a couple issues with it. Um, first of all, I guess, uh, I guess when we read that, okay, guys, rejoice. Rejoice always. Two th one is that it can seem a little bit fake uh, or emotionally fake or disingenuous. Like, well, uh, am I supposed to, well, what does that mean, rejoice? Like, can I directly control my happiness? Like, is there a little happiness knob on the inside of me? I go and turn it up a little bit like it's a thermostat or... How does that work? It, it can almost seem not genuine, uh, like I'm pretending to be happy when I'm not. And in our culture, we really value this thing called authenticity. Uh, maybe we value it too much, but we, it, this whole emphasis on just be yourself. And well, what if I'm miserable? Let me just be miserable. What does Paul mean when he says rejoice always? Um, we think that, that he's telling us to be emotionally fake, but he isn't. Uh, the other problem we have is we live such busy, easily distracted lives. We can almost think, well, I just don't have time for joy. Like I have this long list of duties that I have to do. And I don't know, maybe one day when I retire, maybe I'll have a little more time for joy. I don't know. I know some of you out there, you're retired yourselves. Maybe you feel that even you don't have time uh, for joy or happiness. And yet Paul says this is very important. Um, a couple of points, I think, in getting our head around what this means. First of all, is that joy does not entail the absence of sorrow. Okay? Uh, Paul elsewhere, he, he writes, uh, I believe, is it in 2 Corinthians? I believe it's 2 Corinthians. He describes himself as a sorrowful yet always rejoicing. And that's the Christian life. Sorrowful yet always rejoicing. Jesus, it was said of him that uh, because he had placed the Father ever before him, um, his mouth was filled with laughter, that God anointed him with the oil of joy above everyone else, that no one was happier and more joyful than Jesus. And yet at the same time, he was described as a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Well, which one is it? Well, apparently both. Very, at the very center for us uh, as believers, God calls us to joy. And yet when we live in a fallen world with people around us who are hurt and broken, that evokes compassion. That evokes tears that we still have to wrestle with sin. We need to repent of our own sin. We need to <clears throat> deal with the realities of a fallen world. And yet we do that from a center place of, of joy. That that is the place God is inviting not just us, but, but the whole world to. Um, you know, we can't we can't directly make ourselves feel happy. And I think this is what Paul is trying to say. You, you can't just say, okay, be happy. You just can't command an emotional response like that directly. But you, you can, you know what, you can do a lot of things to indirectly. Uh, for example, you know, when you get, let's say you get, uh, you've had a busy day at work. You know back in the day when you used to get in your car and go to work and come home? You know, places, anyone out there remember places? Yeah, places, those things where we actually used to go to back in the old days. You know, I remember places. Places were nice. Uh, but you remember you used to go places, maybe go to work, and, and then come home, and you were tired. You'd worked hard. But then you choose, what am I going to do with myself this evening? 
I can veg out in front of some television. I can maybe call the family together. Maybe we can play a game of some sort, have some family time. Maybe I can sit down and uh, read a good book. Maybe I can take some time out to pray and to just give thanks to the Lord and worship him. Now, all of those choices, what you choose to focus on will elicit ultimately a different sort of emotional response. It will. It will affect you differently. And when Paul says rejoice in the Lord, what he's saying is what, what are you looking to your happiness? What are you looking to for your happiness? What are you looking to for your joy? We all want joy. You want joy. I want joy. But what are we looking, you know, uh, are we rejoicing in our career? Are we rejoicing in our money? Are we rejoicing in our family? Now, there's some very good things we can give thanks for and be happy about, and maybe some other darker things, some bad habits or some sins that we can look to for joy that you know, we, sh- we, shouldn't <clears throat> we shouldn't at all. And so some then genuinely good things in creation that you know, we, we can, it, no problem, bring us joy. I mean, a nice meal, you come home for work and maybe your spouse has, has made a, a lovely meal, you sit down, enjoy it, fantastic. Uh, there's no reason that that cannot make you happy. Time with a friend, you go out to coffee with a friend, makes you feel better, makes you feel nice, good. And yet we're called to rejoice in the Lord because even though there are other good things out there in the world that can legitimately make us happy if we invest the time and energy and focus in those things, all of those things are susceptible to loss. Um, I can lose my spouse. I can lose a member of my family. I can lose a friend. Uh, Maybe there's a um, really good television series. I just love to watch, but you know what? It can ultimately be canceled and get to the finale and then it doesn't exist anymore. We're called to rejoice in the Lord because he writes our name in the book of life. He is our stability. He is our rock. And that's a joy that can never be taken from you. Paul is saying, invest your happiness and focus yourself on something that you can never lose. See, the Thessalonians, they were losing their jobs. They were losing relationships. They were losing a lot of good things. Those weren't sinful things. Those were good things, and they were losing them. And so he says, find your joy in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. I, I can't make myself happy, but you know what I can do? I can take time out. And I can focus on all that God has done for me, that he created me, that he, he made me, that when I was still a sinner, he forgave me, that one day he's going to glorify me, he's going to bring me uh, into his presence. One day I'm going to see his face. One day I'm gonna have a, there's going to be no more sin in me, no more sin in the world. And I can choose to focus on that. And you know what happens if I choose, choose to focus on the promises of God for a while and talk to him about those promises? I find myself being joyful. So I don't flip the switch and say, okay, rejoice. Uh, but I can go to God and focus on his problems. So he's not talking about a joy instead of suffering. He's talking about a joy in spite of suffering. That in the midst of all the sorrows this world brings us, and this world brings us a lot of sorrows, that in the midst of them, we can still find joy because our God does not go away from us in sorrows. He is with us and his promises do not change. Rejoice always. How many of you, you could use more joy in your life? Yeah. I certainly could. How many of you think your spouse or your kids or your parents could use more joy in their lives because they're a bit dull to be around? Yeah, you you don't have to raise your hand, but yeah, of course. One of the best things God wants us to do is to be happy, to rejoice in in him, to find our joy and our happiness and our strength in him. And he, he goes on. The next command is to pray constantly. Wow, pray constantly. It's like... If I, didn't, <laughs> I, I have trouble, just try praying more. Pray constantly. Pray always. Like, pray all the time. How does that work? Well, pro, Paul may be using some legitimate hyperbole uh, there to make his point. But, you know, you can never... Is there anyone who prays too much? Is anyone out there saying, you know, I, I think last year back in 2019, I, I think I just spent too much time in prayer, and I really need to cut back a little bit here in 2020? No, no one. We all feel like, you know what, I, I, need, I need to pray more. And you know, that's right, I do. I, you know, praying more would be great for all of us. And there's never this point where, in this life where, you know, I'm just spending too much time talking to God. Well, now, to, now, to be sure, you can sometimes 
say you're off praying or be off praying while you're neglecting other duties, like, you know, the maybe I need to clean my room, maybe I need to do dishes, maybe I need to make dinner, maybe I need to go to work, maybe I need to do something and, and I'm just feeling lazy, and so I'll say, oh, I'm just going to pray instead. Well, of course, that can genuinely happen, but for most of us, it, it's usually the other, the other way around. We think we should be praying, we know we should be praying, and we just keep getting distracted with other things. And usually they're not great things. They're checking our social media or watching something else on TV or, or whatever else. When Paul says pray always, I think, yeah, he genuinely does mean those blocks of time where we set aside just for prayer, but also as we go about the day. Uh, for example, my, um, the habit I've begun fairly recently, and this, I wish I could say I've been doing this my whole uh, Li- or my, throughout my children's lives, but it's a fairly recent habit of on, on Saturday mornings for breakfast, wake up. One of the first things we do on Saturday mornings is I take one of my kids out for breakfast. Sometimes we live up in Fairfield. If we just go down the hill, there's a McDonald's down there, but there's some other places in Royston. <clears throat> I can take them and I have four kids. So uh, it's about every month I take out uh, one of my four kids we got for breakfast on Saturday morning. And this gives me good one-on-one time with each child at least once a month, you know, where we sit down, it's just the two of us, no other siblings around, just him or her, you know, my son or my daughter and me. And we get to eat breakfast and talk, and it's a great time. But what if that was the only time all month I spoke with my kid? Well... <laughs> That wouldn't be great. It, that time enables me then through the rest of the month when I see my child around over the dinner table making breakfast as we pass each other on the hallway. Uh, it just helps oil our relationship. It works similarly with prayer. We, yes, we have those blocks of time, hopefully in the morning or the evening or whenever, where we set apart just to open the Bible and be alone with God and give our thoughts exclusively to Him. But... That doesn't have to be just for those times. There's a way of bringing God's presence into our life. We, you know, we go into work, and right before we give a presentation, we just pray, God, help me with this presentation. We sit down to eat our lunch, <clears throat> and we just realize that all our food, everything good comes from God, and we give thanks. And in our comings and goings, we make small talk with God. God today, yes, it's no, maybe no substitute for alone time, just being able to focus exclusively on him, but it's like any relationship, like with your children or your spouse or a best friend. Yes, you have those special times where you go out and have committed exclusive time where you do stuff together, invest in that relationship, but then there's just the, just the, the small talk, the, the little words of affirmation that, that keep that relationship going. And, and Paul's saying, just hey, pray continually. You know, to talk to God throughout the day. Bring him into the mundane. Bring him into the typical. Bring him into the daily. Pray constantly. Give thanks in everything, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And that goes with prayer. Prayers and thanksgiving. Two sides on the same coin. God, thank you for all you've given me. And, and Father, I, I pray that. I ask you that you would help me in this situation. And um, we're called to give thanks and pray. Uh, and you know, a lot of us, this one, you know, one of the things I think that the, this whole coronavirus shutdown, lockdown has taught us is how we relate to time. I think if I had asked people maybe a month ago, two months ago, how long has it been now? And only, a few, only a couple of weeks, I guess. But I asked you a month ago, I said, if I had said, w- would you like to pray more? Many of you would have said, yeah, I, I would like to pray more. I think I should be praying more. And if I were to say, well, why don't you? You'd say, well, I just don't have the time. You know, I got, I got work, I'm running here, I have all these errands, all these places to go. <clears throat> and it's hard, so I have a little bit of time prayer, but not as much as I'd like just because I'm so busy and I don't have the time. All of a sudden, for the last couple of weeks, we've been shutting our houses. We're not able to run errands, most of us. Now I realize some of you might be in the medical profession, you might be busier than ever before. I, re- I, I understand there's a there are some people out there that are, you are busier than ever before, but that's not most of us. Most of us are quarantined into our house <clears throat> in, our, in our pajamas, you know. And all of a sudden, because we're not running here, there, you know, driving to work, maybe we're working from home, but we're not driving to work, that saves us time. And all of a sudden, we have more time. Are we necessarily praying more? Just think about it. Have you prayed more over the last two weeks? 
If you're one of the majority who now has more time than you did two, three weeks ago, are you praying more? Now, for many of us to say, uh, no, I don't think I am. I think I'm praying the exact same amount I was three weeks ago. Yeah, I'm probably giving thanks, I'm taking time to give thanks. And just as was, uh, so that, I don't say that condemn anyone. I'm just saying that should register something. It's, it's not so much about time. It is, it is about our priorities. It's about our, our values. Um, you know, we, we have more time. Maybe we're spending more time in entertainment. Uh, once again, entertainment's not wrong. I, I love a film. I love a good uh, crime thriller. All these other things. Let's just be careful that then when we say, you know what, I should spend more time giving thanks and prayer, but I don't have the time. Let's just reflect on what we may have learned over the last two or three weeks during this quarantine about what time really is. And let it be a challenge too. Some of you realize you genuinely do have more time right now. Use it wisely. We, the quarantine may last a couple months. Use your time wisely. Don't be like, oh man, I just binged on several box sets of season. Now that's not wrong, but you know, yeah, do a little binging. Watch, watch a few shows, like have fun, you know. Um, but have fun with God too. Give thanks. Do, do, in addition to the binging, in addition to the films and the box sets, genuinely in, increase your time of thanksgiving. Increase your time of prayer. Increase your time in reading the Word. Two months from now, when we get out of quarantine, or however long, however long, that's not a prediction, by the way. Just whenever we get out of quarantine, look back and say, that was time well spent. Be wise with your time. And give thanks. So listen, it's easy to complain during the season. Definitely. I, I'm a person who likes to go places and do things. Many of you are too. <clears throat> We're not happy that we have to be quarantined. But let's give thanks. Instead of complaining, which would be very easy for me and probably many of you to do, let's give thanks. Say, God, I don't know what you're doing in this season, but I just thank you that you're with me, that you have a plan for me, and I thank you that you, you want to prosper my soul and bless me and make me a blessing to other people in this season. Help me to find those ways. Pray those prayers. Give thanks. That God can bring good out of every bad thing that happens, including the whole coronavirus and the quarantine. And uh, Great, let's give thanks to God. Look for what he is doing. Then it goes on, says, don't stifle the spirit. Don't despise prophecies, but test all things. Hold on to what is good. All right, now he's shifting gears a little bit. And uh, so we're gonna talk about prophecy for just a second. Yes, the big P word. <clears throat> now at a church like ours, uh, I'm thinking particularly of Fairfield Chapel, um, maybe a bit different over there at Great Chesterford, or maybe your, whatever church you go to, for those of you um, from uh, another church background. You, you come into, uh, you've probably come into these congregations with different backgrounds. Some of you from maybe very strict Presbyterian backgrounds, and some of you from maybe more Pentecostally backgrounds. And so, depending on your background, the word prophecy that can mean uh, like that, that a whole bunch of different things can be flat flowing through your mind right now. Some of them positive and some of them negative. All right. So let, let's just unpack this. So he says, you know, don't despise prophecies. Well, <clears throat> that, that can refer to two things, uh, you know, in the Bible when you're talking about prophecy. First of all is what we call biblical prophecy. And it's a little bit what Paul's been talking about in Thessalonians when he's talking about the return of Christ. The Bible uh, prophesies that one day, just as, you know, Christ came, one day he will come again. In the Hebrew scriptures, what many of us call the Old Testament, the prophets talk about one day the Messiah would come and take away sin. Well, Jesus has already come and fulfilled many of those prophecies he, through his death and through his resurrection. And many of those prophecies have been fulfilled. But many of the prophecies of the Bible, the, in the Hebrew scriptures, as well as the Greek New Testament, um, they talk not only about him removing sin and offering forgiveness, but coming again to rule the world as a king. Those are biblical prophecies that have yet one day, they have not yet occurred. Our hope is in them. We look forward to those things. That is prophecy uh, in the Bible. And that's what Paul has been talking about in the day of the Lord back there in, in chapters 4 and 5. Uh, so a lot, of, um, a lot of sound doctrinal prophetic literature in the Bible that can give us hope. But when Paul speaks about prophecy in a lot of these letters, 
And what he seems to be, I, I think, speaking here, when he says, don't stifle the spirit, don't despise prophecies, but test all things, that's very consistent with his language elsewhere, particularly in his letters to the Corinthians, where he's not talking about prophecies written in the Bible so much, but the sort of prophecy that we as Christians are to embrace as part of our discipleship, part of our lifestyle. Um, what does it look like? Okay, well, once again, many of you have different backgrounds, so you have different experiences on this. I'm going to unpack it, how, how I understand it from other parts of the um, New Testament. Particularly, I, I would encourage you to read 1 Corinthians chapter 14. That's probably the, the one place in the Bible where Paul speaks the most about this gift of prophecy. In the Hebrew Scriptures, God had these guys called prophets where they came and they spoke and uh, they spoke the word of the Lord and they begin with, thus saith the Lord. And God somehow downloaded a message to them and they spoke confidently and with authority. Then on the day of Pentecost, <clears throat> Peter gets up and he quotes Joel, who 700 years before Pentecost had said, one of these days God is going to pour out his spirit on all flesh and your sons and your daughters are going to prophesy. Moses, even before Joel, long before Joel, had once said to his apprentice uh, Joshua, when there's a couple of people prophesying, in the congregation, and Joshua, his apprentice, got upset and said, hey, you guys aren't supposed to be prophesying. <clears throat> Only Moses does that. And Moses says, Joshua, I wish that all of the Lord's people were, were prophets and that he would pour out his spirit on them all. And throughout the book of Acts, we see this idea of being filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesying connected really closely together. And here Paul says, don't stifle the spirit and don't despise prophesying. So these two things go together. You no, know, we can stifle the Spirit. The God who has given you His Holy Spirit. If you're a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit in your life working in you, and you can stifle it. The image is almost like a garden hose. You have a garden hose, and you know you are that garden hose. And on one end, you are hooked up to the uh, you, you know the the faucet. Uh, that is the unlimited resources of God. And, and you are to bring the water of life to the world around you. And the Holy Spirit is to flow through you. And yet you can stifle it. It's like, you know, if you, have you ever been using a garden hose and then like a little kid comes and bends it. And all of a sudden, instead of the big burst of water coming out, all of a sudden it's just drizzling out. That's kind of what Paul is saying. He's saying don't stifle the Spirit. Don't take the garden hose and bend it. You can stifle the work of the Spirit in your life. Now, there are probably all sorts of ways you can do that with compromise and sin and, and unbelief and prayerlessness and lack of time studying Scripture. You know, all, all, so many ways to do that. And yet, in, here in one place, he says at least one of the ways we can do that is by despising prophecies. Mm. What is prophecy? Well, I think that word, I, I tend to uh, not use that word very much. Um, if you come to Therfield Chapel or Great Chesterford, you probably haven't heard me talk about the gift of prophecy a whole lot, uh, in part because that word means a lot of different. It's an over, well, I don't say it's overused word. Sometimes it's a misused word, and sometimes it is a misused gift. And yet, it was misused even among the Corinthians. It was misused in the New Testament. And Paul still speaks about it, though. Prophecy in the New Testament of this type is not someone coming up and saying, thus saith the Lord. In 1 Corinthians 14, it says, the one who prophesies speaks to people for their encouragement and their comfort. I remember once, uh, many years ago, um, somebody asked me if I would come and speak to their young adults group uh, about the gift of prophecy. It was kind of an unusual request. It's not something I'm known for going around speaking on a whole lot. And, but they said, hey, we have a young adults group who want to learn what the Bible says about the gift of prophecy. W would you come and speak to us? And I thought, how am I going to do this? Like, how am I going to do this without it being weird? And, <clears throat> and I said, okay, well, uh, I said, I'll come and do it, but please don't tell the people that I'm coming to speak on prophecy. Just, just tell them I'm coming to speak. Um, tell them I'm coming to speak about encouragement. And so what we did is uh, I came and I spoke and I was introduced and Joshua was going to come and speak to us about encouragement now. <clears throat> and uh, 
uh, I, I began to talk about um, uh, Holy Spirit encouragement, where we ask God to help us encourage and comfort other people. And so I said, what we're going to do now is I'd like us to get into small groups, and I want us to pray for one another. And, uh, and as we pray for one another, and we take turns praying for each person, just ask God to help you encourage, speak words of encouragement or comfort to that person. And so we did that, and we went in small groups, and people were praying for one another. And, um, and then, you know, they kind of naturally flew from a time of prayer to looking at that person and thinking of something encouraging they could say or something comforting they could say. And so the group just did this. They, and, you know, uh, they said, you know, I just... Um, I want to encourage you, and, you know, maybe you don't think much of yourself, but God just sees you as a strong, a wonderful person, wants to use you in great ways, or, uh, you know, I know your gift of uh, music or teaching, and God just wants to use that in big ways, and, you know, m maybe you didn't have much of a family growing up, but God wants to be your father, and they started just speaking comforting words, encouraging words to each other, and it was a powerful time. Some of these young adults started weeping. Some of them were deeply moved. Some of them really just said, you know what, that was exactly the encouraging and comforting word I needed to hear. What were they doing? Well, I think they were doing, if I understand 1 Corinthians 14 directly, I think they were prophesying. <clears throat> now, I never used that P word, and they weren't using that P word. In fact, they didn't know they were prophesying, which is really the great thing about it. And it wasn't until it was all done towards the end, and I said, I said it may shock some of you, but what we were actually doing in here when we were talking about asking the Holy Spirit to empower uh, and guide us in our encouragement and our comforting one another was, well, I think what the New Testament means when it says, when it talks about prophecy. Um, now, I got to qualify this a few times because sometimes once, it, w people can make one of two errors when it comes to the gift of prophecy. One is they just get really weird. Uh, and all of a sudden they go around having a, a word for everybody. And, uh, and I've definitely, I think one of the reasons maybe I don't talk about this as much as I should is because I've seen so much weirdness. I've had people approach me and say, I, I have a word from God for you. And they share it to me and I'm like, huh, okay. <laughs> and it's just something weird. And I, it's almost like a little embarrassing. And I, you know, I kind of, I'm glad I didn't invite my non-Christian neighbor for, to church because they might have just ran into brother so-and-so or sister so-and-so who's just always weird and always sharing the most bizarre words. I saw a picture of a green bean dancing on your head and I think it means that God is saying, and you're like, just what are you talking about? Uh, and it's very easy. So it's very easy. Because people get weird with this sometimes to begin to despise prophesy and say, this is just people's imagination. This is just people's weirdness. Uh, we, let's just get back to studying theology. That's, and so th that's kind of the opposite reaction. These two extremes sort of feed off each other. And so then the other group says, listen, we're going to have nothing to do with prophecy. We're going to sit around and just study doctrine. And uh, there's, there's no need for... And yet... The Bible says there is. One of the, one, if you study theology, if you study the New Testament, you realize that Paul, the great theologian, talks a lot about th this gift of prophecy, that this is something that we, we are to come to church. And you know what? If you think the P word is strange, fine. Don't use the P word. But maybe come to church and say, God, is there anybody you want me to encourage this week? Is there anybody you want me to comfort this week? It, just as I, as I come here on a Sunday morning, now, that, once again, this, I'm not talking about now, but, you know, back when we get to go places and do things again, back when we come, you know, to, to church again, and that we meet as a congregation, although I don't see why you can't do this all over WhatsApp or social media or anything else, maybe you can just pray this morning, say, God, is there anyone you want me to text an encouraging word to? And it just comes out as saying, hey, I was praying for you this morning, and I just felt like maybe I should encourage you with this. You don't begin with, thus saith the Lord. If you're one of those people, and you, you want to step out in prophecy, a few tips, don't, don't step out and say, thus saith the Lord. You know what? Let, let the other person decide that, because that's what it says in the next verse. But test all things. If you get someone who says, hey, I just have some encouragement or some comfort for you, listen to it and test it. Um, Test it. See, you know, if someone comes up to you and shares something and you, you really don't know, is that just that person's imagination or is that maybe the Holy Spirit trying to tell me something? Test it. Take it to the side. Pray about it. 
You are the one to judge. It's not your pastor. It's not your elders. It's not your home group leader. It's not brother or sister so-and-so who's so spiritual. No, you, when people give you prophetic words or, you know, I like to call more divine encouragement, divine comfort, these, you know, spontaneous words of comfort and encouragement, pray about it. You test it. This is not Isaiah the prophet standing up and saying, thus saith the Lord, and you have to listen. This is us as Christians trying to discern the voice of the Holy Spirit. Listen, the Holy Spirit is not the crazy uncle of the Trinity, okay? Like, the Holy Spirit is God's presence with us to take the truths of God and make them spontaneously real in the moment. And this is something all of us, including myself, including myself, we need to step out in more. We need to come and say, because as, as churches, quite frankly, Greg Chesterford, Therefield Chapel, I think we're pretty good at encouraging and comforting one another, but let's involve the Holy Spirit. Say, Holy Spirit, how, who, who, can I, who can I comfort? Who can I encourage? Are there any verses from the Bible I can share with them? Step out. Try it out. You know what? You do your best, and then you leave it with them. You don't follow up. You just leave it with them, and it's, that, it's the, for their job to test whether that word of encouragement is for them or not. Not for you. You don't need to follow up and say, hey, did you listen to what I told you last week? No, just leave it with them and they decide. So test all things and then hold on to what is good. So within the whole world of prophecy, everything that comes your way, test it all. Get rid of the stuff that's a bit weird and wacko, but hold on to the good. And you might find some real gems of encouragement and comfort. Right? I remember as a time when I was 17, man, I was going through a horrendous time. I left my church. I was really bitter like it was a nasty season of life and this strange woman i had i had no idea who she was she came up to me and said you know what as i was praying this morning i just felt like i saw your face in prayer and i want you to know that god is with you in this season of life and she just began to speak comforting encouraging words from a complete stranger and it was at exactly the right moment i needed it and it, it and it, I think it's in many ways it saved my relationship with the Lord. Uh, so be open to how the Holy Spirit wants to use you to speak to others and be open to how uh, you might hear. Test all things, hold on to what is good and stay away from every kind of evil. Evil comes at us in all sorts of directions. It can attack our theology and make us believe weird things. It can come after our character and make us bad people. It can come after our relationships and we have division and fallouts with all sorts. All sorts of evil can come our way. We may be resisting one type of evil. Maybe we're really good at resisting alcoholism or pornography or this. And yes, I'm not doing that. But we're really joyless and bitter and not very much fun to be around. Um, or maybe we're good people and we serve other people, but our theology is a mess. We're believing all sorts of wacky things. Or maybe we got our theology right, but we're not serving and helping anyone. Yeah, evil comes in all sorts of ways. And out of this, and kind of the flip side of that, in verse 23, Paul says, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely, and may your spirit, soul, and body be kept sound and blameless for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, God just wants to change you totally. He wants to wash you. He wants to make you new um, in every area of life. And just like evil can come at us in all sh shapes and sizes, God wants to work in your life in all sorts of ways. You know, for some of you, God has done tremendous things in your life in one particular area. And you have a great story how God has helped you and made you more like Jesus. But you know what? There are all sorts of other areas yet that, that are untouched. God may have brought you out of depression into a place of peace and joy. Great. Now he's going to deal with your selfishness and get you to serve other people. You know, uh, maybe he has helped fix your theology. Maybe you once believed that your thinking was just influenced by culture and society around you. And he's helped you wrestle with a lot of your thoughts and your doctrine and brought sound biblical doctrine to you. And that's great. Now he, he wants to work on your patience. He wants to work on your self-control. There are all these different areas. And your emotions, your thinking, your acts of service physically to other people, God wants to sanctify those. He, he wants to work in you. Now, for some of us, this season of the whole corona lockdown is a great time for that because <clears throat> uh, a lot of times we get settled and there are some areas of our, our lives that get settled and hidden and we don't come face to face with certain character issues in our life very often until there's a sudden change. 
And all of a sudden we're having to deal with aspects of ourselves or uh, relationships with other people that we weren't even aware of all of a sudden. And some of you are, are in that. You, you're in this whole corona quarantine thing and, and you're finding it pretty difficult. Um, you, you're finding yourself challenged. Uh, some of you just maybe uh, being there in the house or maybe your uh, just relationships with the family or whoever it is that you are living with at this time. And um, God wants to challenge you uh, to use this time wisely. To, you know, some of you, maybe, maybe you're a father uh, like me and uh, you're home with your wife and kids and all of a sudden you have all this time with your family. And everyone's, you know, we're just being, maybe everyone's being a la- bit lazy. If you're like me, you're finding yourself in the house and everyone's in a separate room on a device or with a book, something. And it's requiring a, a deeper type of leadership from you. you. You're having to lead your family through this quarantine and you, you need to man up a little bit. I mean, really, f- fellas particularly, really, man up. Take care of your families during this time. Uh, love your wives. Take this time to instruct your children. Normally, you might not have that much time with your kids. They're at school all day. You might work evening shifts. All of a sudden, you got a lot of time with your family. Be wise. Break out some board games. Maybe call the family together once or twice a week. Read a song together. Try giving, and maybe you've never done that. Give thanks together. I just this week, you know, this week for us, I, I felt challenged this week. Uh, before, we went, before we sent the children off to bed, just gathered together and Guys, we're going to go around a circle and we're all going to say three things we're thankful for because it's really easy to complain right now in this uh, quarantine. And we went around the circle and everyone, and at first they, you know, the kids kind of, oh, they rolled their eyes a little bit. Do we have to? And I was like, yeah, you do. If you want me to give you breakfast in the morning, you have to. <laughs> and, and what we did, and it, and it was a good time. I probably need to do more of that. Some of you guys might need to do more of that. This time will challenge you. Also, uh, I think there may be some I, I just want to say that I think some of you, and not just for some of us, this time is a time of challenge, but I think for some of you out there, this time needs to be a time of comfort. Uh, some of you are in pain right now. Some of you are suffering. Instead of being challenged uh, with your own character deficiencies, you're, you're just hurting right now. Um, some of the circumstance for for you, the circumstances around this quarantine has meant either extreme loneliness or being locked up in a house with someone you have a very dysfunctional relationship with, and um, and that can be a very painful thing. And if that's you, I just want to I just want to speak God's comfort. He is with you. He is not far from you. Um, he just says, let, let me love you and get you through this. Let me care for you. Be, be assured of my nearness and my love. And we will get through this. And you will get through this with a closer love relationship with your Father in heaven who knows you and cares for you uh, very, very deeply. And he's going to use this season, uh, just the love of the Father, to, to do a deep healing work inside of you and help you come to peace with things within your side of yourself or with some of these broken relationships that you're having to deal with. And he's just saying, hey, be still. Set the anxiety to the side. Come into my presence. Let me take that anxiety off your shoulders. Let me love and care for you. And I will carry you through this season. He's sanctifying us all the way in our mind, in our emotions, in our thoughts. He who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Isn't that good news? God is faithful. He will sanctify us all the way. You know, for for those of you who keep falling into the same old sin time and time again, you know, you have this sinful habit you just can't seem to get rid of. He, and you're like, I am completely faithless. You know what? You are faithless. So am I. But God is faithful. And, you know, us being sanctified, you know, that's kind of a big word, of of us being changed and transformed and made more like Jesus. That's not based on me being a great Christian. That's based on Jesus being a great Savior. He is faithful. One day you will be free of that sin. You you will be set free. That sin will not be with you forever. You'll be free from it because he is faithful. Brothers, pray for us also. Again, second time in just a few verses, he's calling us to pray. Pray for us. Pray for, your, pray for your elders, pray for your deacons, pray for your leaders. To lead the church during this quarantine has just required a total new way of thinking for us, and we need wisdom. Pray for us. 
Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. Now, of course, there, Mediterranean culture, if you ever spend time in the south of France or Spain, I think we got one person from Spain in there watching on. You know, you, you greet each other two or three kisses on the cheek. <clears throat> very, very normal uh, form of greeting. Here in the UK, it tends to be a uh, handshake or, or a hug or more for just kind of cool and chill, just kind of the chin up. Hey, what is up? We kind of nod at each other. Very British. Um, yeah, he says, greet people. In other words, greet people warmly, greet people affectionately. You know, this way of doing church online, you guys watching through Facebook and uh, me being here in the church broadcasting, it is legitimate church. Like you guys can type in prayers and we can fellowship and they're going to be teaching and worship. It is legitimate. And yet we are missing something, aren't we? Um, you know, the word became flesh. He didn't just become a digital image. He became flesh. And there is something to that physical contact, being able to place our hand on someone's shoulders while we speak words of encouragement to them. Um, it is a legitimate way to doing church, but I don't think it's the best way of doing church. And I look forward to the day when this quarantine is done and we can gather together and um, greet one another with more than a hello. We can actually, I think, you know, the first time we have church, and these doors are open again, I'm probably going to be in a, a much bigger mood to give out hugs than I normally am. And I'm not always in the mood to hug everybody, but I probably will be on that Sunday. Just because, hey, I, I can, you're not just there, you're not a digital image, I can touch you, I can put my hands on your shoulder. Welcome to church, I love you. I charge you by the Lord that this letter be read to all the brothers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Read the word. Spend time in God's word and let his grace and goodness be with you. Well, guys, thank you for listening. I don't know. Now, unfortunately, I do not know that um, if any of you guys have typed in questions. I said we could do a bit of Q&A, but I haven't had any new comments pop up on my screen here. Again, because I think Wi-Fi is just acting up here. And, uh, and I don't have anything here on my WhatsApp either, which is, um, okay, uh, that's not a problem. I'm just going to close in prayer. But if you're listening online and maybe you want to discuss a certain item, maybe about prophecy or maybe uh, when I was just speaking about God being with you and comforting you in this time because this isolation is harder for you than it is for many other people, um, maybe you think, hey, that's me and you, you want prayer, please feel free to message me either through Facebook or through WhatsApp and uh, happily talk more to you, um, you know, in, later today or throughout the week. Let me just pray for you then. Father, I thank you for the people of Therfield Chapel, for Great Chesterford, and for all the others um, watching online from different congregations. Lord, we, many of us are finding this hard. Some of us are finding this challenging, but we ask that you would use this weird season that we're in with the corona to, to work in our lives. Make us a different people. May we not waste time, but may we respond with wisdom to what it is that you're doing uh, in our lives, in our families, in our congregation. Make us a, a better people, filled with faith, more like your son. Amen. All right, everybody. Well, may the grace of our Lord Jesus and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen.